nanohub.org. You can follow along with this presentation using printed slides from the NanoHub. Visit www.nanohub.org and download the PDF file containing the slides for this presentation. Print them out and turn each page when you hear the following sound. Enjoy the show. So today is the day we do things vertically. Reason for that, of course, is because the TEM is tall. So what we're going to do today is try to understand how multiple um, lenses work together and how that forms the overall instrument, uh, the TEM itself, and how we use it. Uh, this is the title of the, of the chapter of the, the Williams and Carter text. Uh, so we're going we're gonna to kind of follow that same thought and just call this really a discussion of how the instrument goes together. Um, the main thing that we want to do with our lecture today, this will probably span a lecture and a half or so in terms of the classroom time, is we want to go over and get a sense of the overview of the entire system, uh, how the different optics are set up uh, broadly. And then what we're going to do is talk about the different imaging modes and different uh, parts of the system in, in, in subsequent modes. First of all, we'll talk about the condenser system, because that's what's used to put the electrons down onto the sample. We'll talk about the objective lens and how that leads to several imaging modes. And then we'll talk about forming images and diffraction patterns in the TEM mode, and we will not talk about the STEM mode at this point. In the course of learning uh, how to use the microscope, I focus on the TEM mode, and the STEM mode is safe for uh, more advanced level thoughts. Um, so then after that, what we'll do is we'll talk about alignment, kind of go through the philosophy of how alignment works on the microscope, and then give a, a sense of step by step how we go about aligning the microscope. And then we'll finish off probably towards next lecture um, some things about calibrations that you may or may not need to do in order to uh, use the microscope carefully and well. All right? So this is a picture of a TEM. I've chosen the 2000 FX because it is the one that we will be using in 582 Lab here at Purdue. Um, there are, of course, other ones. This is a, a model from uh, the mid-'80s forward. And uh, it's, a, it's a fine machine. Uh, it's the one I did my dissertation on, and I have a, a real love for it as a result. I've spent many, many hours with this microscope. Um, looking at it, some of you saw it in lab already. Some of you will see it today. We have the electron gun at the top. We have the condenser lens system immediately after that. In this microscope, it's a two primary condenser lenses with an aperture in between. There's the objective lens here where the sample stage is uh, inserted. This is a side entry machine. And then there's basically four lenses after that that are used to magnify the output of that objective lens. There's a viewing screen at the bottom where the electrons impact a fluorescent screen and give off green photons that we see. That's the electron to photon conversion that you use most often to use the microscope. There's an area here that you put film in if you want to take a permanent image. And then not shown on this particular diagram is all the bells and whistles in terms of the knobs that you must use in order to run the microscope. And again, some of you all were in lab yesterday, and I'm sure that, that I was correct. The, the first impression when looking at the machine is, wow, there's a whole lot of buttons and knobs on this thing. And uh, agreed with that, everyone, I would think? Yeah. And what it is is really each of those knobs does change a current through either an electrostatic or magnetic lens. And with time, you develop a familiarity with the function um, and not so much just memorize the knobs. At least that's how I want to teach it and, and have us uh, think about things. You can break this microscope down. Again, this is a cross-section taken from the 2000 FX manual, and this does not make it look any simpler, does it? Right? It makes it look more complicated because it's showing all of the lenses that are present, um, both the primary lenses here, the first condenser lens, the second condenser lens, uh, the third condenser lens shown here, um, this is really uh, more of a coupling lens, I think, in this microscope here. And then there's the condenser mini lens here. Um, actually, this is what they're doing. Is they're calling this first and uh, second condenser lens coils. This is really C1 as we operate it. And then the third condenser lens coil is C2 as we talk about it. Um, then there's the objective lens region here where the sample holder goes in. And then uh, the magnifying lens is thereafter. And you see additional things like the electron gun first beam deflector coil, right? That'll be on your first test. Right? What's the electron gun beam first deflector coil? No, just kidding. Um, the real thing there is that that's the first one that's used to deflect the beam after the electron gun. There's a second one. These two work in coupling um, to give you the ability to tilt and shift the electron source and the apparent source. 
And again, those of us that were in lab yesterday saw us tilting the source in order to optimize the illumination. And we'll learn how these types of deflector coils work together today. Um, there's other types of uh, electrostatic coils. There are stigmator coils at the end of each system. Here's the, uh, at the bottom of the condenser system, condenser lens stigmator coil sitting at the bottom there, objective lens stigmator coil, and uh, an intermediate lens stigmator coil actually at the top here. Okay. So this is the, the alignment of the microscope as we come through. Again, the filament sits up at the top. There's the accelerating tube through here. And the vein held is the first, uh, first, really the first lens in the system. And we use the condenser lens to look up at the vein held output. All right. Simplifying, um, and, and uh, this does look more simple, we see uh, the electron gun, the condenser system, objective system, projector system shown in the following way with, again, the more primary shift and stigmation coils uh, uh, shown schematically here. And so believe it or not, by the time you are done with the, the five uh, week lab class, you will understand how most all of these things are used to great effect. And so it looks like quite an intimidating task, but it isn't uh, once we start to understand how the systems go together and work, okay? Now, um, thinking about this uh, more in groups, we first talk about the microscope in terms of the electron source. We've already had a full lecture on how electron sources work. We've seen the uh, cross-section schematic of both the Schottky and the thermionic emission sources. This is a, 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 just a simple depiction. And really what we're doing with the electron gun is we're first heating up the source, say in the thermionic case, getting the electrons to come off of the source. The vein held cup is used to focus those electrons down to a point. That's something that the primary operator of the microscope usually takes care of for you. And then the first thing that you do is you use these first and second beam deflector coils kind of as a unit to allow you to optimize the emission on the gun and make sure that it is centered on the optic axis. So we'll do two steps there. We'll first tilt the source so that we have optimum emission and then we'll shift the source so that it's aligned along the optic axis. Those are both, both done with the deflector coils. This thing does not physically tilt. It does not physically shift. We instead use these deflector coils to shift the apparent location of these and shift the apparent tilt angle of the electrons coming off of the source. So uh, the first laboratory we go through and we look at the microscope and we do this step uh, at least halfway through. Okay. The next system that we deal with is the condenser system. Again, just like an optical microscope, the goal of the condenser system is to place electrons onto the sample in a controllable fashion to allow us to choose the intensity of the electron source as it comes onto the sample, to allow us to choose the size of the electron beam as it impacts the sample. And again, uh, what you'll see is that as you use the microscope and you vary the magnification of the entire system, you will have to continuously adjust the condenser system so that you have a relatively well-sized beam for the magnification you're looking at. If you have a beam that covers your viewing screen at 2,000 times magnification and you do nothing with the condenser system but increase the overall magnification to a million, then you will be looking at just the very small center of that beam and it will be very dim so dim that you'll have a hard time seeing much of anything. And so what you have to do as you use the microscope is continuously adjust the condenser system to a pri uh, uh, have, have an appropriate illumination of your area of interest. Again, after using the microscope for a while, the brightness knob that you use to do this, um, the, or illumination knob depending on the microscope, uh, and the shift knobs that you use are just the things you do without even thinking about it. Your hands just kind of start to uh, channel your mind in that regard. Now with this, there are um, three, oh, that's right. So on this is a 2000 FX. There are the three condenser lens systems. The, the C3 we don't usually use. Um, the C1 is the spot size. So I had a bit of a mistake earlier in the lecture. C1 is the spot size. C2 is the brightness. There is a separate lens for doing convergence on the 2000 FX series. Generally, we won't use that. That's used for convergent beam electron diffraction. Um, but what we're going to do is we'll choose a spot size which is basically a single strength on that condenser one system to allow us to choose how many of the electrons from the source we want to bring further on down the column. And then we continuously change the brightness knob as we change magnification to give us a sense of, of appropriate illumination for the sample. The alignments that we'll do for the condenser system primarily involve making sure that we have the electrons coming down through 
the entire system along the optic axis. We'll talk about how we do that centering operation later. Um, we center the condenser aperture. Again, a, a final way that we can choose the size of the beam. And then we use the stigmator coils to make sure that the beam is round. Um, the next system we deal with is the objective system. This is the primary imaging lens. Um, it has the sample immersed within it. In the case of the 2000 FX that we're dealing with uh, in the labs, it's a side entry stage. And so the sample sits with, between a two-part pole piece. Um, the objective lens is the one that's used to do the diffraction and the imaging. Um, and everything thereafter in terms of the intermediate system is primarily just to magnify the output of the objective lens. In terms of alignment, proper alignment of the objective lens is crucial to obtaining good images. We want to make sure that the electrons are coupled out of the condenser system into the objective system appropriately, giving us electrons coming right down the center of the optic axis of the system. We want to make sure that we remove objective stigmation. Um, this forms a primary activity in the laboratory. And then we use both the apertures of the objective aperture and the selected area aperture to allow us to do local diffraction in the case of the selected area aperture, or to allow us to do bright field or dark field imaging, or to choose the number of beams that are used in high resolution imaging. So the objective system is the primary one we worry about. And then really with the intermediate system, Occasionally, the primary operator of the microscope will do manual alignments of the intermediate system. This is done with a pair of uh, screwdrivers moving bolts back and forth so that you physically move the intermediate lenses on top of each other appropriately. Um, so please, I won't even show you where those bolts are. Um, but occasionally, we do do that to make sure that the intermediate system is well aligned as well. Okay? But these are just simply magnifying by a couple of times each, giving us a total of up to a million or so times magnification. And of course, the final thing of note is we have to have something to look at. So we use a phosphorescent or a fluorescent screen um, to image the electrons normally. And we work on the alignment. And we record using either film or CCD or image plates. And we'll talk about that in a separate lecture as well. So that's how the whole thing goes together. Um, and really, the way to think about the alignment is to start with the source worry about its properties, start with a condenser system, worry about its properties, worry about the objective system, and then just choose magnification to simplify it. Okay. Um, so that's the overall uh, look on the microscope. Anyone have any questions about the, how that kind of schemes together? It looks, you know, in, in, in thinking about it, it's not too dissimilar uh, in some ways from the use of an optical microscope. It's just uh, linear all the way down. Uh, and, and in the transmission mode, that would be uh, it, it, it's basically you're using the condenser lenses for the same purposes. You're using the objective lenses for the same purposes. We just have a lot more magnification. Okay, so that's to to, to make this uh, look less intimidating, right? This looks intimidating, the one that shows the entire cross section, but really, it's a bit better uh, than that. Okay, so what I want to do next is talk about the condenser system, and this forms the the first place where we're going to talk about multiple lens systems and try to understand how they go. Um, the goal of the condenser system is simple. It's simply to place the appropriate sized beam, the appropriate intensity of the beam onto the sample. Alignment of the condenser system is important. Um, in standard TEM imaging mode, you can be a bit sloppy. Um, in, in the STEM mode, you'll work a lot more on that. Um, but again, the goal is to bring the probe down onto the sample. Okay? Um, there are a couple of primary variables. Those include the probe size, the convergence angle on the probe, and the intensity. And again, that makes some sense, right? How many electrons, uh, how many electrons are put in a given area, and what's the angle of incidence of those electrons, right? Those are the three primary things. Um, there are a couple of different illumina uh, illumination modes to worry about. There is a parallel illumination. We routinely use approximately parallel illumination to uh, image our sample. If you work hard in most of the modern microscopes, you can do curler illumination, which gives you perfect plane parallel illumination. In some of the most modern microscopes, you can uh, do this with the click of a button. Um, so this is handy for imaging your sample. Other times, you'll want to do uh, a focused illumination. That would be for something like microdiffraction, EDS, EELS. Um, for convergent beam diffraction, you not only focus the probe, but choose the convergence angle carefully. And of course, in the STEM mode, you are again focusing the illumination to a very small point for doing your imaging. Um, the other thing that we do with the condenser system 
is we worry about the angle of incidence of that illumination because when you want to do bright field and dark field imaging, what we're going to find is you change the angles of the illumination to see different types of things in your image. Okay? And so again, we'll want to understand that. The same thing that we use to do the translating and tilting, these uh, coils can be used also to do the scanning back and forth. And so I'll show you how that works in terms of the optics. Okay? So this is our first uh, two lens diagram. And, you know, I, I don't know, in the, in the course of, of doing uh, high school physics, you probably don't see this. I don't recall seeing this too much in high school physics, but again, I'm starting to get old, um, so my memory may be bad. But this is the, the, the sort of way to think about multiple lens systems. As far as the second lens is concerned, okay, it only knows that there is an output from the lens above it, right? It does not know anything beyond where it looks. Okay, that's a fairly important thing to remember. In other words, for any given lens, it doesn't know whether there were 47 lenses above it, right, or simply one, because it only sees the output of the lens immediately above it. And so what this allows us to do when thinking about the microscope and its operation is that you always are really just thinking about a given lens, how it interacts with the lens above it, and what it presents to the lens below it, right? So it takes and decouples that, what looks like a very complicated problem, a very multiple lens system, and it's really just wondering in sequence, what is this lens doing, right, to the information from above to project it down below, right? In the case of the final lens of the microscope, all it's doing is taking the image you've gotten all the way through and magnifying it down onto the screen. Right? In the case of the first lens in the microscope, what it's doing is it's taking the crossover from the electron gun as it leaves the vein hilt, right? as it leaves the electron source and the focusing of that electron, it takes that crossover and presents it to the lens below. Right? And so it's just a series of steps down the microscope column, thinking about how each lens is looking above and presenting something down below. So for the condenser lens system, Let's think about this very simply. We have C1 and we have C2, okay? In the course of aligning the microscope, we bring the electrons up to, uh, we bring enough heat to them, we provide emission, and using the vein help, we provide a point source, uh, a, a gun crossover. Again, that point source can have some breadth that deals with the spatial coherency of that source. But, you know, for the purpose of the diagram, let's pretend we've got electrons coming off from the, the point right, where the crossover occurs. The goal of the first condenser lens is simply to either magnify or demagnify that source. As we choose different strengths of the condenser one lens, we then allow the lens below it to have more or less electrons coming through it, okay? So if we have a very uh, large amount of current running through this, we bring the focal plane up right? Then we spread that illumination out and the lens below will have less ability to collect electrons and bring them down the column, okay? And so by choosing the strength of the C1, this is again called the spot size in both the Philips and, pardon me, the FEI and the JOL microscopes, right? What we're doing is just choosing how many of electrons are we going to use subsequent to put down on the sample. The output of this condenser lens is then fixed, and the C2 lens looks at this point, and by varying the strength of the C2 lens, we have a change in the focal length of this lens, and we either underfocus, focus, or overfocus that lens to provide broad illumination or uh, focused illumination, for example, right, just by changing the strength of the C2 lens. All right. So the goal is to choose a particular C1 lens that determines the intensity and then a C2 lens so that we have an appropriate amount of illumination put down on the sample. Usually when using uh, the microscope in standard imaging modes, we choose spot sizes that are relatively small in number um, but large in terms of number of electrons. There's unfortunately, in my opinion, an asymmetry between the, the way that they label this. Spot size 1 is the biggest spot size, and spot size 9 is usually the smallest spot size. Okay, sorry. Um, but usually we'll operate at spot size 2 or 3 with a fairly large amount of electrons just for getting something bright. 
If you're looking at a polymer, you might not make that choice, right? Because you'll have too many electrons impinging your sample. We have a question from Lior. So the reason that they do this is as we change the spot size, it gives us a fixed point for the lens below to look at, OK? And so what that lets us do is have, again, it's, it's basically what it does is it takes the electron source and just chooses how much of that electron source is used for the next lens. So it's just a, a series of steps. If you wanted, you could do it continuously, right? If you want to go into the free lens current mode, you can vary the C1 continuously. And then you have to vary the C2 to make sure that it's looking at the right spot. And so this is just mostly for convenience. They choose a series of different strengths on C1 and then key everything off of that. It's just mostly for convenience. And uh, on the, the 2000 FX, it's spot sizes 1 through 7. Um, on the Titan, it's 1 through 11, I think. You know, it's just a matter of how many they want to give you as an option. Okay, But the goal of the C1 lens is this is really just to choose how many electrons you present to the C2 lens that they can capture, right? So you see that if we were to take, and I think I have this here further down. Yes, so, so forgive me uh, for zooming down the slides here. But uh, if we look at the C1 strength here, and we have a change in the spot size, as we go from a strong C1 crossover to a weak C1 crossover, you see that we change that focal point, right? And you see that. As we go to the weak C1 crossover, we're collecting more of the electrons that came out of this thing and putting a brighter probe down onto the sample. Okay? And if we have a strong C1 crossover, we're throwing away more electrons. There are more ray paths, right? This is a fixed number of electrons, um, more ray paths that don't get captured by the C2. And so we end up having a dimmer source, but we're also able to focus it more finely. Okay? So that's the choice that you make. Um, again, note the way that I just talked there. I said more numbers of electrons, right? Um, and so I'm talking a particle model again, right? I also told you that somehow we only have one electron um, in the column at a given time going through all of this. Does this make sense? I don't know, right? Um, that just, you know, I switch back and forth as, as is convenient to think, okay? So in this mode, we're talking about particle motion and you know, different ray paths of the particles, all right? And it works. OK. So um, that's the way that the two, uh, the two lens system works. Um, OK. <clears throat> Note that as we change the focal length on the C2, we are necessarily also changing the convergence angle. Um, I'm emphasizing the convergence angle a lot uh, because it affects images. It affects uh, mostly high resolution images uh, and stem high angle annular dark field. It also affects the diffraction patterns uh, in ways that we'll learn uh, subsequent in the class. But it is an important thing to understand uh, is how, as we change the C2, we vary the convergence angle. Again, if you um, have a dedicated uh, third condenser lens system, or perhaps you want to use the upper pole of the objective system, it just depends on how your particular microscope is working. You can actually make uh, pure plane parallel illumination. This is called curler illumination. Um, I think I pronounced that reasonably well. I used to work with a bunch of Germans who would make fun of me when I said that. Um, but I think that's about right. Um, so what we're doing here is we're using uh, two lenses to present the front focal point of the, of the, of the C3 with a spot size, uh, a focused spot from out of the, of the C2 that can be then brought plane parallel down with a, a, a weak lens down here, for example. Um, the, the nice thing about the curler illumination, it is pure plane parallel. And so as we'll learn in diffraction later in the class, you can actually get nice spot diffraction patterns from a large area of the sample and control that. And again, on a dedicated uh, system with this, it's very, very convenient to use. All right, so that's one thing that's a specialty mode of operation. And you can see all it does is just take an extra lens to do that. Additionally, with the microscope, there is a uh, C2 aperture, pardon me, a condenser aperture. I don't want to specify it as being C2. Uh, a, a condenser aperture, some microscopes will have more than one. But generally, the mode of usage is we choose not only the gun crossover uh, and the lens strength to choose the number of electrons, but we'll also put in an aperture to, again, cut out some of the electrons from appearing. Um, 
Generally in the 2000 FX we use the largest one because we tend to want a lot of intensity for routine imaging. But if you are trying to form a very small probe for uh, diffraction or analysis, you may choose a smaller condenser aperture to again throw some of these electrons away and focus more finely down. It's just an operating choice. And so again, all an aperture is is a strip of metal with a hole in it, right? And then it blocks off some of the electrons and that's it. So we'll take a look at that as we get down on the microscope as well. Um, you can uh, take and focus these electrons. So if with the appropriate C2 lens current, you can take and basically either magnify or demagnify the probe, uh, the electron source, right, down onto the sample to form the probe. And so it's possible to have this perfectly focused to have the minimum probe size. And that's one of the modes that you will on occasion operate with this two condenser lens system, okay? Um, Additionally, you may have a desire to have a focused probe, finely focused probe, but systematically vary the convergence angle. Uh, when doing convergent beam electron diffraction in particular, this is desirable. Um, and so you can use either the upper pole of the objective lens or a dedicated C3 lens that will allow you to vary this convergence angle while still maintaining a fine probe, the finest probe that you can get. And again, we'll get to that later on in the, the higher level of the class, but it's just something to know that it exists. Normally, you don't fool with this, but it is there, okay? Okay, we talked about this earlier. Again, as we change the strength of the C1 from strong to weak, we are changing the relative amount of electrons that get collected by C2. Um, as we collect more, it gets harder to focus them down to a smaller probe, but we get a brighter intensity. So this really gives you a sense of the trade-off that we have as we use this uh, system. We're really always trying to choose intensity, right? We're trying to choose size of the beam, and occasionally we want to vary the convergence angle. So those were the three points that I mentioned at the beginning, okay? Well, that's kind of how the condenser lens system works. Um, so what we'll do in the second lab is we'll learn how to center the beam on the optic axis of the condenser system and uh, just get a feel for having all of these lenses operate with respect to each other. Um, again, just to emphasize one more time, the, the nice thing about all this is that any given lens only knows what the lens above it is doing, right? And that makes it easy to think about. Okay. So do we have any, any questions on the condenser system or, or multiple imaging? Yes, sir. Yeah. No, no, no. Actually, this one I'm not because you'll note that the C2 has to look at a different place, right, to get that. To, so the C2, so this is a good point. Um, when you uh, change the spot size, when you go to the little lever that changes and chooses the spot size, the microscopes will automatically change the range of C2 so that they're looking at the appropriate crossover position, okay? And that's one of the things that the modern, the modern microscope does for you, is it just gives you this uh, kind of close already, okay? Okay. So um, uh, next time we're on the microscope, we'll see that, we'll watch, uh, we'll go to the page that shows all the lens currents, and you'll see how those things change in step together, okay? Okay. Any other questions? Okay. Sorry. Um, a final thing about the condenser system, at the end of the condenser system, there is a set of uh, scanning or tilting and translating coils. These are uh, electrostatic coils that are used in concert. Um, what they do is they basically work together to do a double deflection of the beam, and you can do it so that you have either a translation of the location of the beam or an apparent tilt of the beam. Uh, I don't want to go into all the optics of how this goes, uh, you know, how the output of this and the output of that coupled together, but this is really just a nice simple way of thinking about it. Really what you're doing is you're just allowing these two things to work in concert to provide what appears to be a different source location so that you can move and shift the beam around, or if you desire, tilt the angle of incident illumination. We do translations continuously during using the microscope um, because as we change magnification, the different intermediate lenses are not always perfectly aligned, and so the beam will shift around on the screen, and so you just have to kind of tweak things around to keep that centered. So the translation knobs are used continuously. The tilting knobs are used less often, um, but they're used whenever we do bright field and dark field imaging, whenever we deliberately change the angle of an incidence in order to get a particular diffraction condition 
for imaging. Okay, so again, this is something that we'll learn how to do and operate. Um, and these are working in concert. In the case of a stem, you're using the scan coils to systematically tilt, um, pardon me, translate the beam back and forth to form the scanned image, just like you would in the SEM. Okay. Okay. The uh, Anytime you buy a microscope, you get a nice thick manual. Um, sometimes reading through that manual can be difficult, uh, but you will always find in it uh, ray diagrams that are accurate for your microscope. Um, this is, again, stolen from the 2000 FX because that's the one we're using here. And it shows how in L mode, in S mode, in S mode temp, in these different operation modes, how the ray diagrams actually look. And so, you know, they don't look too dissimilar to the sort of things I've been showing. It's just showing them all operating at once. And if you have a desire at some point to understand how to have a very good pre -parallel, uh, plane parallel mode or a converged beam mode, or, or you know, you can go through and uh, look through these diagrams and parse your way through thinking about them the way that I've been showing you for individual systems. So it's just always in there for every microscope. And uh, same with the illumination system, as you'll see below. Uh, for different magnifications, it'll show how all the lenses are talking to each other. Okay. Um, with the objective in the imaging system, what we want to do next is talk about how uh, the sample and the objective system work together. We'll talk about the TEM mode uh, in terms of forming images, bright field, dark field, high resolution, forming diffraction patterns, and we will skip the STEM mode. Again, um, I will teach that later on in the 640 class. Um, it's just more than we can do in the short period here. Additionally, uh, in my opinion, the STEM mode is one that takes a bit more skill uh, to start off with. Um, maybe that's just an opinion. Um, so this is really what we'll do is we'll talk about the relationship between the sample and the object plane um, of the lens. We'll talk about the TEM mode for forming images and forming diffraction patterns and look at how all the ray diagrams go together. Okay, there is... Uh, because the sample, can we say this in the, in the way I want to say this? We are dealing with relatively large magnifications out of the objective lens. We're dealing with relatively small focal lengths. Um, as a result, the position of the sample with respect to the lens at a given current is important. Okay? If we return to our overall thought on a single lens diagram, right, we know that for a fixed lens strength, there is an optimum point for the object, the back focal plane, and the image. And so one of the most important things to start off with here in understanding the objective system is trying to understand where the sample goes with respect to the objective itself. The objective lens is fixed in its place, right? But its focal length changes as we change the current through it. And so when we change the current through the lens, we have to think about where the sample sits in order to get the optimum image. If the sample's in the wrong place, then we are going to not focus on it well, right? Focus it well, and our images will not look good. Now, there's uh, two ways to think about this. You can either stick your sample in, right? That forms the location of the object of interest, right? A piece of aluminum. And you can change the focus on the objective lens to bring that into focus, OK? So you're varying the strength of the lens in order to meet with the object plane that's defined by the sample position. Another way you can do this is you can use a fixed objective lens current and then move the sample up and down until it's in focus. Right, so looking at this next slide, the question is, right, are we using a fixed point here and varying the strength of the lens to image that fixed point? Or are we picking a fixed point for the lens and varying the sample position to bring it into focus? OK, so there's two choices to make here. Um, and the choice you make depends on how you want to use the microscope. Um, I Sometimes when you'll take an intro introductory class, uh, in fact, one of the other professors that teaches this occasionally doesn't go through all this. But, but I, I do because even though it introduces some complexity, there are different times to work in different ways. If you are 
working with your samples so that you're changing the sample position a lot and tilting the sample a lot for looking at different crystallographic directions, then what you want to do is you want to find an optimal position of the sample where that as you say tilt, it doesn't move around. Okay? The sample sits on the end of this long rod. It's held usually at the O-ring or perhaps at a point that's fixed on the end. And the way that you move the thing around is not by perfect X, Y, and Z, but rather an X that pivots about that tip, right? And a Y that pivots about that tip. And so there is some non-precision in that X, Y, and Z motion. Additionally, if you are off in X a little bit and you want to tilt the rod about its axis, then you will see that the position of interest, say my ring finger and the ring here, right? As I tilt, it's going to translate from side to side. And so the goniometer, that's the name for it, right, is not one that has all five axes perfectly in sync, right? You can't move in X and Y and not see some change in Z, right, because of the way the thing works. If you tilt, it's even worse usually because that's where you start to see non-optimal position on that, right, if you have it not at the right height. And so there's a position for the goniometer called the eucentric position, and that is the position where that is optimal, that we have the sample located so that if we tilt about the rod axis, the primary axis of the TEM rod, we do not see much motion from side to side. If we go to a less than optimal place in height, for example, then that does a arc, right, with respect to X and Y as we change the tilt. Okay, we'll go through and see this on the microscope. It'll make more sense. I'll put a glove down on the end of the tip and we'll do a translation around my finger and you'll start to see this. But the point is, is if you are using the microscope to do lots of tilting, translating, moving around, then you want to try to have that sample sit at the right height so that as you tilt, it doesn't move around. Okay, so in one mode of using the microscope, we're more concerned with making sure the sample position is in the best place and then changing the objective focus to look at that best place. Okay, that's the way we use this normally when doing diffraction studies, when doing diffraction contrast studies. Now, if you are instead using a microscope for high resolution imaging, you are going to get a particular objective lens delivered to you that has an optimal spherical aberration coefficient for a fixed current, okay? In other words, they design these things so that the spherical aberration has a value that is minimal at some particular current. And when you buy the microscope, you are told, okay, the newest microscope, you know, I have a button called eucentric focus, and I hit a button, and it always goes to the same objective lens current, right? Because that's the optimum one for imaging at the highest level of resolution. And so instead there, I bring my sample into focus by moving it up and down in X, right? So I change the way that I think about things based on what I want to do. So for tilting and translating, looking at this uh, diagram here, we're going to choose the object plane to be at the eucentric position, right? So that we have the minimum translation as we tilt. In the case of the high resolution microscopes, you'll use a fixed objective lens current and bring the sample to that fixed objective lens current, okay? They work very hard to make sure that at that fixed objective lens current, you are close to the eucentric position as well. And in fact, usually with a, a copper mesh grid with thin carbon film, one type of sample, right, that's very common, you will be at a very good eucentric position. If instead you're looking at metals that you've electropolished and the sample height's different, you're not in as good a shape, okay? So there's some complexity in this. And so we will get down, and the first thing we're gonna do on the third lab is understand eucentric position, how to find it, and its relationship with focus, okay, for the microscope downstairs. So it's all a matter of whether you choose the position of the sample and focus the sample with changing of the current of the lens, or you use a fixed current because it's optimal and change the sample position to bring it in focus. That was a lot of information and some of it a bit confusing. Any questions on that? Jeremy? Any thoughts?
it'll get a little bit better as we start to do it, right? So just depends on how you want to use the microscope. Lior? No? Okay. Okay. Now I'll ask more people as I learn more names. Okay. Okay. So the heart of the machine is the objective lens uh, for doing the transmission electron microscopy imaging modes, for doing diffraction, for doing diffraction contrast, for doing high resolution imaging. It's the, it's the core of the machine. Um, this is the, the primary lens diagram that we talked about at the beginning for, say, the objective lens. We're going to take the two-part objective lens and model it as a single convex lens. Right? If we have some object, we have a particular focus, gives us a particular location of the back focal plane, a particular location of the image plane, and thus a particular magnification. Again, all of the rays coming off of this object that are parallel to each other are focused to a point in the back focal plane. Parallel rays focused to a point in the back focal plane. Parallel rays focused to a point in the back focal plane. Okay, And again, the rays move onwards in space until they run into each other to form the image down here. So this location here, the back focal plane, determined by the strength of the lens, is also the location of our diffraction pattern. Okay, diffraction. We've all heard of diffraction. Everyone's heard of it at some point during their career. Has anyone not run across diffraction? No. Okay. So anyone run, not run across x-ray diffraction in particular, right? The idea of using x-rays for doing crystal structure. Everyone's got that. So the idea here is when doing diffraction in the TEM, we again take advantage of Bragg's law that says that there are particular angles where we get constructive interference of the electron waves, right? And those particular angles are the ones that show up on the other side of the sample constructively, and they are parallel to each other, right? So all the rays coming off of a, of a diffraction off of a particular plane are going to be parallel, and thus they're all going to get focused to the same point in the back focal plane. Okay, that's diffraction encapsulated in three sentences, all right? So you have waves coming in. Bragg's law is satisfied for particular directions, right, due to particular D spacings and their interrelationship between the wavelength, 2D equals N uh, lambda sine theta. Um, the, no, 2D sine theta equals N lambda. Sorry, I'm doing it in my head. 2D sine theta equals N lambda. Um, the outcome, right, is that the, Sample essentially acts as a grating, a diffraction grating for the electrons, right? And so there will be particular angles coming out of the sample where diffraction will occur. And those are all parallel um, rays coming out, and so they're all focused to a point in the back focal plane. So at the back focal plane, we're going to see the diffraction pattern as a series of spots, okay? And that's what we would want to image if we want to do crystal structure imaging. Okay, if we want to know what the crystal structure is, we take the diffraction pattern by looking at the back focal plane. If instead we want to form an image, we look down here where the image is formed by this lens. So the question is, in using the microscope, are we interested in the diffraction information or are we interested in the image information? And what that does, looking at the next diagram here, is it determines where we choose the intermediate lens strength. Okay. So if we have, this is just the same diagram. I used PowerPoint to make a group out of it, right? And I extended it to make it long. OK, so it's just the same diagram, all right? So we see, again, sample, objective lens, back focal plane, image plane. And so if we want to do imaging, then we're going to use the next lens down the column, the intermediate lens, to take this plane here as its new object plane. So what was the image plane? for the objective lens becomes the object plane for the intermediate lens. And as a result, that image is magnified through a series of lenses to give us the final image. Okay? If instead we want to look at the diffraction pattern, we will choose a different intermediate lens strength so that the intermediate lens is looking up at the back focal plane and projecting that as our new image down onto the screen. Okay? So this is incredibly powerful. This is why the TEM is such a great, great, great tool for characterization of materials. In any given situation, if we have a thin sample, we take our electrons, we have them pass through our sample, we can look at either the diffraction pattern from that or the image 
from that area. Okay? And, and the area we look at is where the diffraction information comes from. We can choose particular pieces of diffraction information to form the image. And so if we want, we can go through and use an aperture, for example, to, I'm going to skip down a little bit here, to choose just one set of rays to image with. So this is a little further down the way here showing a bright field. Again, electrons coming in, diffracting off of a particular set of planes, parallel beams coming down to a focal point. And what we see is if we put an aperture in, we can choose just those ones that did not to first order interact with the sample, right? Or ones that diffracted to a particular angle by moving that aperture over. So what this means is that the TEM allows us, through the choice of the intermediate lens uh, you know, strength, to either get a diffraction pattern or an image right, from the same area. And that image has convoluted within it the diffraction information. Okay? And that's really the core strength of the technique. Now, I think what I'll do is uh, take a minute here and, and stop and say, anyone have any questions on, on this part of this, right? You see, all we're doing is we're taking advantage of the fact that the back focal plane is where parallel rays are brought to a single spot, right? That spot pattern gives us diffraction information. We can image that. If instead we want to magnify the object, we choose to look here and magnify that. Good? OK. How do we do this? There's a button. It's <laughs> great, right? So there's one button called magnification. And there's another button called diffraction. OK? And that's because these things, the location of the back focal plane and the location of the image plane, are sufficiently far apart right? that you can have one fixed intermediate strength look at there up above at the back focal plane and then another one look at the image plane. There's some small alignment to do there to, to get it optimal, but the first order, if you're interested in the diffraction pattern, you hit a button, the intermediate lens strength changes, it actually gets weaker so that you look further up the microscope, right, and you then project the diffraction pattern down. If you instead want the image information, you hit the other mode, the intermediate lens strength gets stronger, you look closer up the column and project that down. Okay, So very easy to do. Um, this is uh, really, I made that little final emphasis in the last part of class about depth of field and depth of focus. So this one is, I always get them mixed up. Depth of field is in the image, depth of focus is, is no, depth of field is in the object, depth of focus is in the image. So the reason this works is because the objective lens has enough magnification, right, that these things are kind of separate, right, but not so much magnification that the depth of field, no focus, depth of focus is so large, right, that you can't discriminate these things, right? If, for example, the depth of focus was a meter, then the intermediate lens down here would have to be about, you know, a couple more meters away, and the microscope would be very, very tall, okay? And then the thing that's nice about it is that by the time you choose uh, whether you're looking at the image or the diffraction pattern, the magnification gets large enough that the projector lens, it's, it just knows which way to go, right? You, you, you will go through and you hit a button and these things are all lined up and the depth of field is large, focus is large enough that you can end up magnifying the right thing all the way down the column. So when you hit magnification, right, you'll have fixed intermediate lens strengths. As you change the magnification, they all change in concert, right? So that all you do is just increase the magnification of that image. When you're in diffraction mode, there's a fixed place for the intermediate lens to look. And again, that's magnified down the column. So it works well and, and, and easily from there. Otherwise, this would be very difficult to do, OK? OK, I think I want to stop here for the day, OK? And we'll, we'll move further in on this next time, OK?